What I want to see this game is just crazy picks literally everywhere, right? Just everywhere. From okay. Huma or, or Everyone. And okay. I just want to see a bloodbath. Standard lanes, 2v2, 1v1. I want the mids to go at it. You know, that's what I want from Challenger Series. Okay. If it's going to be messy games anyway, at least make it an exciting messy game rather than why is he halfway up the lane without a board? <laughs> so. Make it a fireworks show. I can get behind that. Yes. So. Yeah, really, yeah. It's going to be the first ban. So usually that's an explosive pick, not on the board. Uh, Same bands as last game so far. We've seen the Aurelia coming out from Millennium. It's Trundle coming out from Puma. Mm -hmm. um, then we're likely to see next, see if I can remember. I can't remember. No, I can't either. <laughs> um, this is why Stress writes them down. I don't know why I haven't I don't know why his. either. I have a pen and I have paper, but I just didn't do it. <laughs> Um, so, oh, we are expecting like a Vlad ban, a Ryze ban, of course, going on to red side. Nearly going to be banned against right. uh, Impaler here. So, there were actually no jungle bans towards Impaler last game. I mean, Nidalee, Kindred, they were all left available, That's but true. neither team decided to prioritize them. Yeah, of course, because we had Gragas open, Rek'Sai open. We did have the Zillion and Nivea ah, ban. Ah, that was it, one. yeah. Yes, it's all yes. coming back to it's me. It's all coming back now. Yeah, now uh, that we've banned it again. Ryze and Vlad were banned for... And then, so that's, that's true. The big change. So I knew it was there. It just took a while. Just to needs to there. dig it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, are we going to see Vlad and Rise both banned in this game? I mean, Millennium are going to have to ban one of them. They don't want Huma to play it. Well, they could just leave both open. Oh, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> that's, Rise that's the alternative strategy. So if there are two OPs Huma. left available, then what you can do is you can leave them both open and be like, okay, you take one, we we'll both take get the other. One. Yeah. Um, we get preference on yeah, Boosai, yeah. That's it, see. So whereas Millennium are just straight up saying, oh, we're nope. just going to ban him way the Vlad. You guys have nothing worthy of banning. Which means that Huma kind of have to ban the Rise, otherwise they kinda Millennium do, yeah. just get it. Yeah. Which means that then you have a lot of Ale first pick. Could be the Karma once again. We have seen that prioritization ah. didn't work out for Huma in the mid. But it is going to be the Shen ban, and then it has to be the Instalock Rise. You, you can't take away from that. It's... Rides is even after the nerfs on 611, he's still a very mm. strong champion. Rod of Ages, a little bit more expensive now, but its value still hasn't been taken away. It's still a great item on the rise. Yep. And uh, I mean, uh, it's just a great Rise is good, is what we're saying. He is. Yeah. But do you think Maybe. that's worth banning away the, the Shen? Do you think that caused enough issues for Huma? The thing is, like, the, about a Shen, players that can play Shen well mm. are just really irritating because. Yeah. The thing about Shen is he always provides global pressure, always, because mm -hmm. he's always going to have either his teleport or his ultimate. So it's very difficult for you to try and force plays around the map because he's always going to be there. So if Huma don't have an effective strategy or know yep. of a real way to deal with the, the, the Shen, then just take it off the map. Rise, there are plenty of counter strategies to dealing with a Rise. Like we saw the Velkars dealing with the Azirodia, but yep. if you can, um, oh, sorry, the Syndra versus the Rise matchup earlier on, if you can just keep the Rise at a decent distance because he has a short range, you can punish him pretty heavily for it. So there are ways to play around the Rise, and I guess Humor is saying we don't know how to play around the Shen, we do know how to play around the Rise, this yep. is our strategy, let's see how it works. Let's chip it and see what happens. So Brom and Gragas were the first two pickups coming in from Huma. Well, is the actually is is going to be the uh, Olaf lock in this time from Millennium, and also Tabs Ash is going to be returning. That's a jungle, almost certainly. That mm. is a Olaf in the jungle. Back when I used to cast Joko in PGL, he was bringing out the Olaf back then. So mm. this is all pre-buffs. He was just a big fan of the Olaf in the jungle. Mm. He thought it did really well into things like Rek'Sai in particular, because uh, you just you trade really well. You actually have really good sure. early clear, and uh, it's it's just one of Joko's specialties. So. Or it used to be anyway. Clearly, yeah. he's still familiar with it. Uh, sure. I mean, it makes sense. Olaf comes back into the meta and still knows how to play the champion. Uh, only seven seconds left for Huma to lock in their choices. We are seeing less and less Caitlyn on the scene, in, just in Challenger. Like, it still picks a lot in LCS and stuff, but Challenger teams just don't like the Caitlyn. And we're actually going to swap away from that last minute to the Ezreal. And uh, Vic uh, that's not Victor, that's Azir, is a different shape champion. We'll be bringing that one for right. Huma. So Kedra going for the mid to late game. Azir, obviously he did have his Arise tower damage removed on patch 611, mm -hmm. but a lot of people, players in particular, uh, still finding him very valuable because he still scales well, his poke is still very strong. When you pad that up with an Ezreal, their ability to siege is, is good because they can just sit under turret, they can get a lot of damage down, mm -hmm. and then while their tower taking potential is not as strong, yep. their ability to just sit underneath it and force you away is still as powerful as ever. So you have this great beefy front line, you can see Huma sort of working towards another sort of, it's not so much a team fight comp, 
um, in the sense that you want to go for a 5v5 scrap yeah. because Ezreal's not the strongest in team fights. You kind of want to kite back a little bit. You want to be moving team fights like a flowing sort of engagement mm. uh, and just keep your opponents at arm's length using this this big front line that you have. And then once they've taken a decent trick of damage, that's when you then look to try and force a fight. Lots of disengage on that team, but Millennium have a lot of engage with Ash coming in, the Maokai, and also the Karma and Olaf. So kind of like reversed roles here where uh, Huma were actually the team who were trying to like launch themselves at Millennium and now Millennium are trying to do the same but this time they also have the Ash to get involved so very interesting see if they can play the opposite side of this uh, composition matchup yeah it looks like that uh, Millennium the thing that's gonna be difficult for them is mm. Really forcing these fights because the amount of disengage from whom is very strong. Yep. It's going to be another matter of you need to set up those flanks either with the Olaf or with the the Maokai. Ideally with the Maokai because he's the one with the hard car control. But you have a great sort of pincer attack where you can distract your opponents with the Maokai flank and then fire the Ash Arrow to instigate the actual engagement. Or you can do the opposite. Do you know what I mean? So yep. you you come in from one side because all the attention gets drawn to that actual. Uh, lane of attack or avenue of attack you don't respect the potential flank and you you end up getting game of thrones so uh, <laughs> it's it's it it's quite diverse and it's the adaptation that millennium have compared to huma where their only real strategy was to actually either run at your opponent mm -hmm. or run around your opponent give them the run around let's uh, see if that comes out here and the final ban was or the final pick rather was nah so uh, yeah, pretty good matchup into Maokai. Nah, pretty much dumpsters most tank matchups yep. because tanks can't get on top of him and just can't really do anything. Uh, I believe the bans on screen are incorrect. The last ban was Nivea, not Shen. Oh, so but here's us talking <laughs> just about the Shen. And they still didn't pick it. That's the interesting thing. No, that would have not. thrown me through a loop if they banned Shen and then they just picked it. And I was like, wait a minute. But interesting that the opposite towards the Maokai over Shen. Like, that tells me that they really want to go for those team fights rather than the global pressure. Because, like, when Maokai gets involved, yes, he offers more than the Shen in the team fight, but doesn't have the same in terms of global pressure. So I think the... the I was going to say the difference is the fact that you your Maokai provides a little bit more peel mm -hmm. for the Ash, but that's not true at all. It's literally Shen's like motto is, I keep AD carries alive. Like, that's yeah, kind of, well, with what the is, ultimate, yes, yeah. but with the Shadow Dash, you kind of dash into people. Like He's kind of a weird ninja in that he like taunts people and wants to get hit versus being but stealthy. He, he's still drawing attention away from the AD carries. That's true. He? Whereas the Maokai, his ultimate will give you damage reduction, mm -hmm. but if you just factor in like in terms of self-peel and the fact that... Um, Maokai's Arcane Smash. Actually, that's completely irrelevant to this. Game. <laughs> but uh, his Arcane Do Smash continue. did get nerfed, which actually hurts his laning phase, mm. uh, the Maokai, which is why he's been falling off, because he's not as powerful in the lane. So I honestly don't know why they decided to pick the Maokai up over the Shen, yeah. because I think that they could have gone away with the Shen here. Um, I would like the Shen. The only thing I can think of is it's a slightly more reliable engage. Yeah. So if you do decide to go for the flank, it's point and click rather than Shadow Dash. That's true. So it's 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 because obviously you can miss an Ash Arrow, um, and so this way you can actually just point mm. click. I have now started a fight. Yeah. I mean, there's less around uh, playing around side lanes as well if you're running the Malkai versus the Shen, because Shen you can sit in the side lane, then TP, and then TP back, whereas Malkai is like. Basically, you just have to make sure the engage works, otherwise top lane is going to die, um, or like the top lane tower. So, yeah, it's going to be a different dynamic, but again, like just like the first series, it's a team running a, a very different dynamic to the first one. So I just want to see if this works out for Millennium, because I, f I feel like they played the last composition really well. Um, Pretty played Control Mage, did great. This time, kind of, I'm not sure if he felt pressured to pick up the Rise, because it was like, well, we left it open, so now you have to pick it. Because um, this is like, it's not a Control Mage on Pretty. No. Pretty prefers like the Inivias, you know, like Zillion even, for example, which both were banned out in this game. So but maybe they a, got, did they get pick baited? As a mid laner, you should be able to play. Oh, right. yeah, of course. Like, that's just kind of the ex yeah. expectation because of how strong he is. But this was something that we talked about. Like, Azir is good into Ryze because he mm -hmm. has the range advantage. It is so hard for the Ryze to actually close the gap against an Azir simply because of how big the, the range disparity is between the two mids. And during the laning phase, you get poked out a lot. But Ryze is able to run the teleport. So it actually makes up for the weak laning phase that he has against an Azir. And you will be allowed to scale up. What you want to do is the Azir is just get as many ganks down as you can and when you have the Azir Gragas combo there's no reason why 
Huma can't set that one up for themselves. Gank over and over and over again, making it very difficult to deal with that one. So we have the full rosters and the picks here. And once again, the hashtag MIL win and HMA win for uh, for Huma. So jump on Twitter, use the hashtags, and then we'll be seeing what you think later on today. And um, yeah, that is HMA. We're having a conversation in the office of HMA or H or H, H. Can't even say H now. I used to oh, say that all the you time. Mean H. Yeah. All oh, right. Yes, because people, um, for some reason, think the way in which I pronounce H. Yes, is incorrect. It's the English um, way. Unfortunately, the rest of the world pronounces it H. I got yelled at a bunch, so I changed. Yes. I got. But I turned into a sheep. I do not pronounce it Appy, do I? It's <laughs> Happy. <laughs> yeah. You're happy, love. How's it going? <laughs> You're happy. Yeah. You're happy. No, it's I am happy. Thank you. <laughs> what I. What I what I do not say properly is water. I pronounce it water. Can I have some water, please? Oh man, I've triggered Vedius. <laughs> well, yes, that frustrate the because I'm supposed <laughs> to call them H2K as opposed to H2K. Mm -hmm. um, so right now it is Huma versus <laughs> Millennium. <Stop>. Uma, <laughs> Uma. All right. Anyway, completely distracted. So potential of a lane swap. Could we see it? Um, if we're going to see it, probably going to see it from Huma. Um, simply because you want to avoid the the Ezreal into the Ash. Ash can actually be quite strong against the the Ezreal, simply because Ezreal is going to go tier early on in lane. Not that great at trading back. You have to land those skill shots, and Ash can just hide behind the minion wave. Once you get some focus, you can walk up, hit you, mm -hmm. and then you're you just have the range advantage as well. So Karma Ash, you can just run up, hit, run boy, run away again. So lane swap is going to be coming out from Huma. <laughs> going to be avoiding those standard lanes, and let's see if Millennium have learned from their mistakes. That's great. We've seen a lot of nice interactions between the players starting off the game. Gragas having a conversation with Nar. Mid lane, Bryce talking to Azir. It's very interesting. Just got a lot of farming to, to oh wait, really to start off this game. Krizland and Wenobo go to the top lane. See that swap, and uh, yeah, I mean it's a lane swap, so we're gonna have probably a good four or five minutes where we don't see a lot of interaction. So. Interestingly, Millennium, apparently they weren't expecting this lane swap to come through because Kaze, he was still on the top half of his map and it wasn't until Huma um, had not shown themselves in the bottom half of their own jungle that Millennium realized. So Kaze, going to be pretty slow, not going to be able to get any experience off the back of that, but Wow, he's only going to start getting himself experience as well because notice he wasn't given any of the small uh, jungle monsters. So it's actually going to be very even for both top laners. The big thing is Huma, already on top of this turret, are going to get an ever so slight tempo advantage. A lot of missed minions to start off this game. Oh no. Yeah, it's going to put them so far behind because they should be able to push out. I don't think we're going to see like a big uh, advantage or disadvantage this time around as both three players will hit that tower and junglers just do the jungle thing. So kind of looking towards later on in this game because a lane swap is a lane swap, really. Um, as we head towards that mid game, we'll be having uh, Huma try and get involved. We're also not going to see that 1v1 matchup between um, between Na and, uh, and Maokai. With the your first Maokai, you don't want to see it. <laughs> no, you don't, which is actually really good for Kaze. Uh, also, first dragon is going to be Infernal. So Millennium have a lot of members down here. We'll see if they can uh, go for it to start this one up in lane swap. Okay, so because it's Infernal, what you can have is Millennium. They will now rotate round to the Drake, pick it up. Because Joker's in the bottom half of the map, they then take it, return back to standard lanes, get that very early advantage. They've decided that the Infernal Drake isn't worth investing in early on, and they're just going to go back and continue on with the lane swap. So um, I am a little bit surprised that Millennium decided not to put priority, given how strong getting an early Infernal Drake is. Mm. Simply because if you get it at three minutes, that increases the likelihood of getting three Infernal Drakes total. Yep. Um, so Huma are now in a position where they could do it. It largely depends on the positioning of Impaler and whether or not he's in the bottom half of the map once the turret gets taken by Huma. So um, the interesting thing here actually was the fact that uh, Chrisland and Wendelbo didn't they didn't leave the uh, turret once it was taken. They actually stuck around and they froze the minion wave uh, to soak up a little bit of extra experience, which was an ever so slight adaptation to what we normally see. Uh, and it actually bought JL a little bit of time. I think they were okay to do it because they knew they had the tempo advantage anyway. It enabled them to get that deep port down in the lane. Um, 
but it's not resulted in any big advantages other than that ever so slight CS lead that JOL has. Yeah. So very similar to what we saw in game one, where simply because Huma got themselves the tempo advantage early on, they got to the tower at first, they were able to get the deep ward first, they were able to swap around first, it has allowed JR to spend more time in the top lane, picking up an extra bit of farm, and so he will now have the level advantage once more, and it's going to be a very similar story to what game one was. And now we're starting to see a trend where in lane swaps, Millennium have a tendency to just leave Kaze out to dry, and they're more interested mm -hmm. in making sure that Tabs gets the farm that he needs so that he can be that big hyper carry. Kaze has been playing a lot of tanks as well. He used to play a lot of like Poppy and kind of off tanks, uh, like Echo, that type of thing, where they can do a little bit more. Um, for versus just being a straight-up tank. So kind of makes sense because they can still kind of catch up and be just as efficient on um, lower lower gold. Of course, you want to give some gold to the Maokai, so he is decently tanky, but they still perform their role of soaking damage. And because Millennium did not prioritize the Infernal Dragon, it means their strong side was on the bottom side when they swap back up. So, uh, of course, they will take the Infernal Dragon. However, look at the collapse coming out from Millennium. It's very low. Will be spiced away by Impaler. They may pick up a kill here. It's going to be onto Wendell Bow, but uh, he's going to sacri uh, sacrifice himself for the greater cause. That'll be first blood over to Joko. So, not sure which is more valuable, getting that first blood and the assist, or getting uh, that Infernal Dragon. If they can pick another kill onto j -Well, then I would say very much worth, but Kadrill's coming in here to save his small fairy friend, and uh, he will get out. So we're going to get a replay of exactly how that broke down. It's simply a matter of Impaler. He's got such little health, he's forced to disengage. No way he can provide the necessary peel to help Wendelbo escape. So he, they just peaced out. They left yep. him to dry. They uh, tried to continue on with their aggression. I think pretty wanted to get on top of Impaler. But he pathed in a way which meant that they couldn't get the collapse down. GR is forced to use his flash. Uh, in exchange for the exhaust coming out from Millennium. So ever so slight advantage in terms of summoner spell trade going over towards um, Millennium. Mm -hmm. But the big thing here, the really big thing, is the fact that while JWoww is going to be soaking up that big minion wave in the top, JWoww cannot set up a freeze. The wave has to push back in favor of Kaze. So he's always going to be able to receive this farm uh, and that's going to be big for him because he is that Maokai, he is that tanky top-line frontliner that while he doesn't necessarily need items to be relevant, it's always going to help because the sooner he gets yeah. those bonus stats, as Kadrol. Kadrol making the play, but unfortunately Pretty did not have tower aggro, so he's just going to ruin prison him and stroll on out. Uh, neither of them used summoners, and Kadrol did use ultimate, so just a bit of uh, fun in the mid lane, but nothing really too big. Kadrol also picked up the uh, Negatron for Cloak first, so... He is fairly tanky. Pretty has his core as well, as Rise, so he's pretty happy. Uh, in the bot lane, Taps is opening up a pretty sizable gold advantage. Uh, he's got 70 CS up against 44 here. And you can see the 400 gold advantage he's picked up, even without assisting in that first blood. So he's in pretty good shape. Yeah, once again, Tabs just building such a big lead over Crisland. And to think that these two AD carries actually met many times on the LCS stage. Mm. Uh, and now they are meeting once again here in Challenger. So in the retirement home, we do have <laughs> a, a lot of yep. old faces meeting once more. But it does seem that Tabs is the one coming out ahead typically in these lane swaps. And just comes back to what we were talking about earlier with Millennium putting their emphasis onto making sure that Tabs is the one getting this farm, freezing the lane for as long as he can and just soaking up as much as possible. But because the wave is pushing towards Crystal, he should be able to close the gap relatively quickly. Uh, you'll only ever have a, a slight advantage going towards um, Tabs. The question is, where are they going to move Tabs now? He is level 6. He could look for a potential pick onto Kadrol, but because of the cleanse, uh, Kadrol could just result in burning the summoner spell yeah. for it. Well, Joko is coming in to the top lane. It's Olaf uh, as a level 6 Nar. He does have Mega Form. He's going to bounce away, get into the crunch. Uh, and Joko will follow up. And there's a lot of that, there's a lot of damage. You cannot Nar ult and Olaf when he is Ragnaroking. And that will be a kill over to Millennium. Oh, JWoww. Mistimed yeah. it. Yep. Yeah, he. You could see that he was holding on to his ultimate, yeah. waiting for Ragnarok to fall off because he was like, okay, I'm not going to die. What I need to do is wait for his ult to die. He's got Ghost. He can't flash after me. Mm. I'll be fine if I just ult him away. He ulted just a second too soon, maybe even half a second too soon. He's very close. And because of that, the rest of Millennium had enough damage, even through the stun, because he'd already started that arcane smash animation mm -hmm. on the Maokai, so that was enough damage to then get themselves the kill. And really, JWoww, he went past the danger zone, Pulse. He that did. river 
is the the point at which you have to be very mindful of. And the big thing now for JWoww is he's actually thrown a massive lead away because what you really want to do is if you're the one shoving your wave out, uh, let, hang on a second. Let's just backtrack a little bit more. Okay, where backtrack, backtrack. Kaze was able to shove underneath the turret. Big minion wave pushing towards Kaze. And there was nothing that JY could do about it. So you want Impaler to then rotate to the top half of the map, help you shove that wave underneath Millennium's turret. So then the wave pushes back towards you. Mm. But because of the gank that Millennium set up, and because JY was just ever so slightly overextended, he ends up getting punished for it, and he ends up losing his life. Now have a look at Joko. He might get caught out, but he is going to be absolutely fine. It's so a little bit preemptive, but because now they've seen Joker in the bottom half of the map, JR knows he can be more aggressive, so maybe he can finally get that wave pushed underneath the turret, yeah. and things won't be as bad as, as they were originally. Yep, no jungler to really get involved. Pretty is locked in a mid lane, so uh, he'll try and do gnar things and be irritating and push Maokai in. And there you can see, actually is pushing that in. So actually shouldn't be too hard for Kaze to CS here. He's trying to set those minions before it hits the tower. Um, but Maokai, not the greatest champion at CSing on the tower, unfortunately. And JWoww eventually gets it in. So about 20 CS advantage. Going to be slightly closed here by Kaze. He's actually trying to get the freeze off. Um, Impaler, or rather, what am I saying? JWoww uh, not having vision there and actually just seeing Joko on that ward will back away. So Kaze gets a decent freeze here. He had like four minions stacked there. So I think he's going to be able to keep this there for a pretty long time. He, uh, he should be able to, especially seeing as he has vision in the river, so he knows if Impaler's even remotely anywhere near looking for a potential gank. But speaking of potential ganks, Impaler and Wundobo hovering around the uh, hovering around the river, potentially trying to clear out some vision. The dragon is going to be spawning in about 30 seconds. It is a Cloud Drake, unfortunately, but Tabs now, he's overextended just a bit. Going for this 1v1 up against Krizlin. There comes the volley, but the TP coming in may save him. Kaze coming in. Great barrel, actually, by Impaler will disengage the fight. And Pretty also can't get involved. So that is the end of that. Big trade in summoner spells going in favor of Huma right there. Not only do they get the teleport out from Kaze, but they also get the heal out from Tab. So when you're on this low mobility AD carry going up against a Gragas Azir, you have to be very mindful that every summoner spell will be very valuable. So. Uh, good pickup from Huma just to draw some pressure, but again, oh, actually, finally, that minion wave in the top half of the map is now going to be pushing towards Huma. So, what you want to do if you're Millennium is because both your sideways are pushing towards the enemy base, you actually want to send your bottom lane up to the top half of the map to guarantee mm. that wave kits underneath the turret. And then, what you want to do is send your top laner to around the dragon area, get some vision control down. And if you have your jungler in the nearby area, you can get both of your two members to then shove up uh, against the AD carry. The The idea is you, you want the lanes to be pushing back towards you and you need safety to do that. So just making sure that your jungler is near you depending, regardless of whatever decision you make, is very important. Yeah, in these slower games and JWoww and Impaler will zone a Joko away from this red buff. And we're kind of just seeing this game slow down just a little. Well, actually quite a lot. Mid laners have just been farming away. We saw that small altercation, I think, earlier. But uh, from there, they've literally just been farming and they have uh, over 100 CS each. But Tabs has really been the one who's been soaking up the most farm. Much like the first game we saw in this series, 130 already at just 13 minutes in. He is uh, already getting quite big, has not even gone boots. He's feel very uh, not threatened. Pretty's gonna get oh, knocked right into the tower, the one-two punch, and he's gonna try and uh, leg it to safety, but he's not gonna make it in time. Crescent coming into this mid lane as well. So that was actually a really nice barrel into the Emperor's Divide. So that was actually uh, a result of multiple things happening, but Four members of Huma in the middle lane right now. Huma have very few ultimates available. I think it would be risky if they want to try and really commit to a siege. The Joko overstepping just a bit. But he's going to get fine. out of that one. So he's fine. He's cool. Uh, and so Huma now with the numbers advantage in a good position to go for this Drake. Teleport is up for pretty, but there's not really enough vision down for Millennium to set up a proper contest. And because of the positioning of Joko, seems he's more interesting getting the collapse onto JWoww. Yeah, he's uh, coming in to the top side here. We'll see if something very similar to last time happens. JWoww is actually nowhere near getting ultimate, so he's going to have to flash away preemptively. But Olaf is very fast, and he will land the first undertow, so I don't think JWoww is going to get out of here. Nope. Gets E'd and taken down. Reckless Wing will do a lot of damage. Next one's going to be Infernal for that dragon. Uh, so we've got uh, actually two Infernals in this game already, as the next one will be spawning.
So this is where Pretty, he gets caught out of position. They don't have the vision on Impaler. And it's funny because that is the exact play that Millennium made last game in that exact spot to actually get an engagement onto Huma. So mm -hmm. Impaler taking notes, it does seem, as now two members of Millennium, they might be caught out. Wendell Boat launching the ultimate, doesn't really land onto anyone. Impaler looking for his ultimate, lands onto Taz, will knock him towards Wendell Boat. Krizlin coming in as well. Tabs has got to flash away, but right into Impaler. So they just pick up the kill. Teleports come in, but will be cancelled. That was um, an interesting TP, uh, an interesting flash from Tabs. Tabs wanted to try and create a gap between him and Krizlin because he had one stack left of that concussive blow. If he could just delay it long enough to get the damage down onto Impaler, maybe he could trade one for one. But unfortunately for Tabs, it did not work out. And it comes and backtracks towards not actually having that heal. If he'd had the heal, maybe it could have bought him some time, a little bit more of a gap between him and Krizlin. Unfortunately for him, it was not enough. And that results in Huma picking themselves up another kill onto the overextending tabs in the bottom lane. And we will return to normality. So 50 minutes in, five kills so far. 1,000 gold advances to Millennium. But uh, Huma do have those dragons, so got to keep an eye on that one as this game continues. Joko got those two kills, so he's already very scary on that Olaf. So we need to keep our eyes now on how Millennium decide to assign their lanes, because the reason why Pretty got caught out earlier on was because of the fact that Tabs and Masterwork didn't really know where to go. The bottom lane was pushing towards Huma. The top lane was pushing towards Huma. And rather than send Tabs and Masterwork up to the top half of the map, they went mid. And being mid once again, they could get caught out. Hador coming in, Sly Glide, ultimate right into Impaler. Easy kill with the barrel roll. Masterwork also gets poked out. Just a great play from Kedral. So that's the risk you run when you send your bottom lane to the mid. You don't have the support from the rest of your team. You don't have the same sort of peel that you had in the game before. And when you're an Ash without Flash, it's just asking for an easy gank coming out from Huma. Yeah, very easy kill there, as you mentioned, for Kedor setting that one up, being more on a playmaker. Good to see in this game. Has a Nash's tooth already built up. And Huma will now try and push in this mid lane. There comes the True Shot Barrage. And Wonobo will keep trying to tank up these creeps. Got to be uh, cautious of Dioko, who's coming in from the bottom side of mid lane. Uh, can you say bottom side is bottom side a thing? I it was like right side and left side is like a thing. But bottom like half bottom, bottom map. Bottom half, yeah. Or bottom half of the lane. Mm. Interesting. Interesting it's not like, yeah, bottom side or top side. You would say top side, though. You could say top yeah. side. So maybe... I'm not that maybe pernickety side about thing. it, Pulse. You could say whatever great you word. want. I, I love pernickety. Should use that more. What? 98% <laughs> to Millennium. I don't actually think I've seen a vote that high for a team ever. We've seen a lot of 90% in like all over the world. I don't actually think I've ever seen a 98%. 98. I seem to remember a Fnatic game getting to 97 once. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's the I highest remember, I've seen. I can't remember who Fnatic were playing. But 98%. It's not really 98%. And the funny so thing about this series. A lot of Millennium fans or no Huma fans? <laughs> well, at least one. <laughs> at least one. At least, at least one. one. But that's the that's a weird thing. Like I this is not one of those series where you feel like it's complete it's not like SKT versus like Huma right now. It's you know? Um like this is the first game was actually fairly even. This game is not snowballing out of control. Um but in terms of fan vote, damn, Millennium just brought it to Huma. Damn son. Damn. Where'd you find this? Uh, <laughs> uh I don't even know where that quote comes from. No, I don't anyway. either, but it's it's a good one. It is indeed. So want to take stock of some of the items that have been completed because that knock ideally wants to be the uh, split pushing terror up against the Maokai because we have to backtrack all the way to the early game where once again JRAW was the one with the advantage in CS and if you just look at the 280 carries because of poor lane assignments coming out from Millennium it's actually allowed Krizlin to close the gap and actually get himself a level advantage so Millennium in response to trying to say, right, let's try and shut down JWoww. So Joker hanging around the top half of the map, could be looking for a potential dive onto JWoww. They need to be mindful, though, of the fact that he is almost at a full Narbar. Yep, approaching the Narbar. Joko is uh, a patient hunter, though. He's going to be sitting in this brush. And he's going to probably wait out JWoww's ultimate. And uh, probably gank him afterwards. Olaf is still there. Joko is still in that bush and has not moved. Okay, he's moving now just as JWoww's meter is going down. 
He's probably this trying to so bait out the awkward. hop as well. Like he can't. I mean, which avenue does he come from? The wave isn't underneath the turret. <laughs> Will he go left? To come in from the Will back. he go right? And if he comes in from the front, then JR is just going to go in. So he's coming from Kaze the back. Kaze jumps in and he's going to hop to safety. Reckless swing and the continuous undertow oh, no. should be enough down. He's going to follow after. Takes one last tower shot. Oh, oh he misses no. the undertow. Get a range. Reckless swing will get the health refunded as well. And oh. Kaze. Oh, he's going to go no. down. <gasps> oh no! That literally could not <laughs> have gone any worse for Joe. He tried to hold the door <laughs> open oh, for Joko and he ended up both dying. Oh no. What, wait, for all that setup <laughs> to then go into a double kill for JWoww, oh. everything that Joko had achieved prior for Kaze, setting up all those ganks down onto JWoww has just been completely negated. That physically <laughs> hurts. Oh man, that was that was a hashtag challenger big play right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I hope we get a replay of that pretty soon yeah. because I just want to break down how how truly awful that was for any of them. In 0.25 <laughs> slow motion, please. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, we've got this dragon going down. Oh, okay, it's going to be smited, yeah. There's no big damage abilities coming out. Okay, we're going to see that replay so here. So here we go. So Joko decides to come in from the he flank. Right. He's tired of waiting. So he takes three turret shots here. He's still tanking the turret. JR is buying plenty of time. Kaze fails the flash. Joko misses the axe, right? And then Kaze comes back because he has to take the turret aggro. Now, the smart thing here would have been Kaze goes left, Joko goes down. Mm -hmm. There was no reason for both of them to run through the turret. They they did have vision in the jungle. The reason for it, they could have seen Kadrill, to be yeah. fair. But it, they, it, worst case scenario was they would have only lost one rather than two. Yeah. Um, I just... Like the whole dive itself was just it was too forced anyway. Yeah. They, there was not a, an ideal situation to go for that. He is a black cleaver, not. And it, there was just, it was too greedy from Lenium. They tried way too hard to force that. They gave away another Infernal Drake as well. And it was just. <laughs> ah. Round two. Ah. <laughs> There's no tower here this time. And Joko, uh, again, is trying to get this play to happen. But yeah, Kajol, I love how he just kind of walked into top lane and was like, oh. Okay, I guess I'll just take the three minions and walk back <laughs> mid again. <laughs> I'm not needed. Um, so, okay, that gank's not going to happen. Carly's just like, you know what, I'm out. I'm just going to take jungle now. I'm just going to go towards Rift Scuttler because that did not work out for us. Uh, Huma, what does that mean for them, though? They're now ahead in kills. They are ahead in gold very slightly. They have three dragons over Millennium. Um, and they're honestly in a pretty good shape uh, in this game. So what it actually means is the fact that JWoww is no longer completely irrelevant. Um, because mm. he picked up that gold. I'm just going to quickly have a look at how much gold he have is actually sitting on. He is. He does have an 800 gold lead above his counterpart, which is reasonable. Um, but have a look at the positioning right now of Huma. They could be looking for a potential engage. They could oh. be. They could be, or not. Or not. Mind. Or not. Oh! Wendell Bose is kind of standing still. Uh, he's been tethered down. Arrow misses. Joko moving on to the Braum now. Kajor looking for an ultimate to be set up. Good ultimate coming in from Braum. Lands on for three. Impaler also his ultimate onto the whole lineup. Good tabs. Bye. He is out of there. Great follow from Kajor. And the tree will go flying into the back lines. Crystal and Kajor getting locked up. Soulflare will land onto them. But Pretty now getting chased down by Impaler. And JWoww on the toe will land. And that will save the life of Pretty as he also flashes away. A three for one over to Huma. Things just keep going wrong for Millennium. Tabs misses the engagement. Joko unable to get onto the back line. Oh, Kaze no. gets himself a kill. And now Joko, he also goes down because he tries to back on a ward. And everything just keeps going well for Huma. And it, to me, it just feels like that one dive in the top lane has just really hurt Millennium's tempo. And right now they feel the fact that they have to force a play and everything just keeps going wrong. Absolutely, on tilt right now. Huma pick up so many kills in the mid lane. The tower, the Baron. Kaze is going to be closing in and see if Millennium can pick up any exit kills from this. But Kaze, he's by himself. Does the Malgai have the damage? Yes, he does for now, but he'll trade his life for it. That's a lot of assists going over to Huma. They just came up so far ahead from that play. So let's have a look. Tabs, he tries to force and engage. Misses oh. Wendell Bow. Uh, and then Joko tries to carry on. So much attention going on to the support of Huma. Just keep your eyes on the positioning of Joko. This is what we were talking about with the uh, Olaf, where he can get split off by his team. Tabs then gets knocked in by the Gragas to quickly get deleted. Good ultimate from Impaler to, to guarantee that. But it's just then enables Krizen on the backline to just 
join the fight and look for the cleanup. And then with Pretty being really unable to do anything else, there's no way that Millennium can uh, get themselves uh, anything extra. They are able to take down the Tier 1 turret in the mid, but still, Millennium going up against a Baron-empowered Huma right now, who have two Infernal Drakes that, let's not forget, Millennium could have claimed for themselves yeah. in both instances, yet decided to give away for free. So while we've been praising Millennium for their very smart map play and being able to play around what was somewhat of a weak lane swap, uh, they they just seem to have completely lost their composure, and now Huma are in the driving seat. I've honestly been kind of disappointed by Millennium's map play in pretty much both series. Like, yes, they played the, uh, or both games rather, and yes, they played the composition well last game, but they messed up the uh, the early game really hard, and now in this one, in the mid game, they are also messing up pretty hard against uh, Huma. And I just feel like they got a little too, um, they tried a little too hard to make these plays happen, and Huma were quite happy to pick up the kills um, as Millennium just kind of handed it to them. And Huma have picked up such a big advantage now. That was not a good ultimate, but it was <laughs> it was zoning in the way. It will be up very shortly because he is at level 13 it's and about isn't Ezreal. A message. It, it is. It's a warning shot because now Huma are going to zone away Joko in this bottom lane and Karen trying to push this one in. Unfortunately, it was uh, only cast minions left, but there is another minion wave ready to go. So we'll get some melee minions up in this. So but looks like the top wave is pushing in favor of Huma. So that's going to be helpful towards applying pressure to Millennium. But right now, Huma just trying to get what poke down that they can. This is likely going to be a very slow siege because the wave clear from Millennium is actually pretty good. Uh, and unless Huma really decide to pull the trigger, they're, they're not going to be able to take this turret quickly because this was something that we mentioned during Champions like Tuma very good at sitting underneath the turret, but their actual ability to take the turrets is not as strong as, say, your typical uh, AD carry would be, as Ezreal sure. doesn't build much AD. Yeah, he will get the extra attack speed, though, and when he's grouped up with all his friends, uh, he'll be able to uh, Essence Fox them all, and they'll all do a little bit more damage. And they eventually take down the bottom tower, will rotate to mid now, and uh, Huma have gotten a pretty decent Baron power play off of this. Uh, it looks like they are planning on backing off now as a Dragon is now spawning, so should be able to pick that one up as well, which is no, not going to be too bad. It's going to be Ocean, so I'll be happy with that pickup. And that'll be 26 minutes in. So probably looking at another one, actually, to spawn before yep. uh, L the Dragon. One more. Uh, and it will be another Inferno. Wow. So just as we called it. Mm -hmm. Literally, we said it at the very start of the game, First Infernal Drake, you take it at three minutes in, then you have the potential for that three Infernal Drake, which is great because you get that 24% additional damage, and then moving into the Elder Drake, yep. you then get 50% of that on top of your 24%. So that's going to take you up to 36% additional AP and AD, which is absolutely crazy. Numbers. So numbers, ladies and gentlemen, numbers. Um, and Cage was already on like 360 AP, so he's going to be uh, he's going to be getting up there. Got a lot of Huma members moving on to Kaze into the top lane. Going to be a flash away by the Maokai, and Joko is trying to cover his retreat. Masterworks coming in. Nice off flat. Will uh, stop Prison and Wenowo for now. Impaler doesn't get in there at the right time, but uh, their Baron, I believe, has just timed out. Pretty is trying to reinforce this defense from Millennium, but uh, Huma over time are just kind of taking everything away from, uh, from Millennium. And this last inner turret will be the last one. So Huma right now, they're just grouping up to, as you rightly said, to put pressure down onto this final tier 3 turret. But look at the teleport coming out from Kaze. Joko looking for this engage here, looking for the undertow. Great Emperor's Divide will zone them all away and pretty. I'm not even sure why he did that. And that will mean that Krizna will follow after as well. That's just a dead rise and Huma will just continue to push. Oh. How the mighty do fall. Rise struggles to close the gap. Ooh, Impaler goes for a bit of aggression. It looks like Huma are going to be able to guarantee themselves this tier 2 turret in the top lane. There are no further objectives for them to pursue. They're just going to be happy with that one and back away. And it just boils back down to what we were talking about during Champion Select. Hey, if you have a strategy for dealing with the Rise, then why not give it to them? This is here is very good at making it difficult for Pretty to actually close the gap. Yeah. It's that big range advantage that Krepo was talking about earlier on in the day. And uh, that, that right there is a prime example of, yeah. of Rise versus Azir. I mean, there we go. You just see the team. Well, I say team fight again, but it's Huma trying to siege. 
into a TP coming out from Kazi, and then pretty just kind of, oh, I'm going to run around this wall. Oh, wait, this is a terrible idea, yep. and I immediately regret my decision. Exactly. And to make things even worse, Millennium had two wards that they could have teleported to, one in the tri bush behind yep. Millennium, Which would have been and a one great in the ward. bush next to them. So Millennium just, they could have done a double teleport for that play as well. You could have had Joker run at them, initiate with the Ash Arrow, mm -hmm. come in with the double teleport from the flank, get the collapse down onto Kadrol. It could have been a great executed fight for Millennium. And falling apart. They are just falling apart. The ship be going down, Captain, at, yes, it at is. a 90 degree tilt. <laughs> Time to bail out. Time to uh, make our way out of the sinking ship because Millennium, yeah, really weird. Uh, I feel like this this is very rapidly getting into the second series of the day where it's just like uh, the winning team of the first game should be able to pick up the second one, goes for a different game plan than the first, and then gets wrecked. And we're seeing this again. So uh, best of luck, Misfits. Hopefully you, uh, you don't <laughs> win the first game and then do the same as the rest of the teams because... Millennium, I really do feel got baited into that rise pick. Like it's not a, it's not really a pretty champion. Um, yeah. Well, the thing is, to be fair to Pretty, I don't think it's that him that he's no, quite bad. I don't I, think so. I, it's, it's been a combination. Of I really things. just think it was that dive in the top. Like, yeah, he didn't have any <laughs> influence on Dioko <laughs> deciding to dive top inner onto uh, onto I mean, I just, it makes no sense. They forced that play so hard, and there were so yeah. many options. And their lack of priority around the dragon has also been a big factor. Is JR, he has the teleport. Huma just want to get a bit of poke down. The Baron is about to spawn, and look at the vision control coming out from Huma. They just have full vision around that objective, and now they're using their superior range. Just get poked down onto Millennium, force them back, and then they can look to try and pick up that Baron and try it in the game. Kaze is just not very tanky. Um, he's gonna, actually, that was quite nice, just punching the uh, Murkwarf so he can get the sap magic. Lots of spells being thrown around in mid lane, but Toss pushing, Bart's pushing. And Huma are looking for, uh, not a flank, but just they literally just gonna walk Huma? to top lane and just take it. Um, that was I don't think I've ever really seen something that was that Joko was bizarre. Going for another tower dive. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this time under mid turret. What even just happened? Huma just walked up to top lane and just took an in him. And now Millennium will look for an engage, but Jay Wild, great ultimate onto two. Joko pops Ragnarok, but he can't really get onto anyone. Impaler is tanking everyone from Millennium. He'll eventually go down. Good arrow out from Tabs. This could be a good turning point. Wenemo is going to flash away. Pretty's trying to get in range, but he gets chunked down. Jay Wild will back away, but does have the Guardian Angel. Millennium are going to turn their attention onto him, but Chrislin is completely untouched, and he's just laying waste to Millennium. Comes oh. in for the first kill, look for the second. That's going to be claimed by Kajol. Finds the soldier. Soldier will take a second. And Pretty is going to go down into his guardian angel. The team will huddle around him, go in for a pep talk, and uh, Joker will, will wave goodbye to his friend as he will go onto the spawn pad. And this will be the game. Huma Whoop. do such a great job of keeping Millennium at arm's length, which is exactly what their composition wants to do. They have so much poke damage. They have so much disengaged tools that it makes it impossible for Millennium to fully commit to the fight. And because of how they executed that final team fight, they're likely going to take the game and tie up this series. They're going to go on to the Nexus, and I am the 2%. Huma take the game over Millennium 1-1 on the week. That was an unexpected result, Vedius. Yes, it was. So that 98% must feel like fools right now. Yep. Yeah, that one guy who voted. That one guy who voted. Congratulations, you were correct. It's like it that was, one guy uh, the that win. predicted all the world's order, like who would win all the That's way to true. the That's true. Maybe end. not quite as impressive as it's that. Definitely because definitely as uh, impressive as that. Yeah, like, as who impressive. Who would have thought that like, after game one performance of Huma, yeah. where they had a good early game and things were looking shaky, and then game two, things again were looking pretty good for Millennium. They had it, all the tools that they needed. Mm -hmm. to set up their composition for success. They had the Rise, who was scaling up. They had the Ash, who was scaling up. Mm -hmm. and they have the Flank, for engagement from Joko and Kaze. And they have all the means to close the gap against that really good Kite Comp. Yep. And then they don't do it. Instead, they go, let's... I have a great idea. Let's 2v1 dive top lane. And then Kaze goes... Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good idea. I like this plan. <laughs> I like this plan. And then they regretted it. And then they lot. regretted it um, immediately. Today is a day of just stick to what works, please. Like, in both series, they execute perfectly. The winning team executes perfectly. Second game, they try something else because it's just like, oh, that worked so well. We can just dump to them and then they lose. Second game of like the first series, it's like we ran a snowball composition and just disrespected the opponents and then lost. Second game, 
Yeah, just played wrong. And you should uh, you should write a book and title it Challenger Series. Challenger right? Series, and yeah. And just have in giant capital letters, play comfort comps. Yeah. And then we could sell that to millions. Think of all the teams <laughs> that could get into Challenger. We could, yeah. Like, I mean, it really does feel like a different <laughs> topic every week on Challenger. Like, all the teams just follow me. It's like the day of upsets or the day of just, like, doing weird things in the second game. Um so we are going to be soon getting into our final best of two of the day, which is going to be Misfits and Epsilon. So you would say that Misfits would be the favorite going I into would, that series. I would, but not anymore. I'm not <laughs> I believe they're going to win the first game and then throw the second oh, one. Man. Just we'll... like when they went up against Forge? Yes. Right. Because they have a possibility to do that. I really feel like Misfits is the type of team who mechanically outplay their opponents and then fail on like the, the macro. But we'll have to see if the prophecy will ring true as we take a quick break in this one. But when we return, Epsilon and Misfits will be joining us and taking to the rest. So stay with us. Which avenue does he come from? The wave isn't underneath the turret. Will he go left? To come in from the Will back. Will he go right? And if he comes in from the front, then JR's just going to go in. So he's coming from Kaze the back. jumps in, and he's going to hop to safety. Reckless swing, and the continuous undertow oh, no. should be enough down. He's going to follow after. Takes one last tower shot. Oh, he oh, misses no. the undertow. Get a range. Reckless swing. We'll get the health refunded as well. And oh. Kaze, oh, he's going to go no. down. Oh. And he's just laying waste to Millennium. Comes oh. in for the first kill, looking for the second. That's going to be claimed by Kajol. Finds the soldier. Soldier will take a second. And Pretty is going to go down into his Guardian Angel.